I'm delighted to welcome Jessica Trisco Darden, who is assistant professor in the School of International Service at American University. She's the author or co-author of several books, including two which we will focus on today, Insurgent Women, Female Combatants in Civil Wars, which was published by GU Press, so thank you, Jessica, and Women as War Criminals, Gender, Agency, and Justice from Stanford University Press. So thank you for being here today, Jessica. Thank you for this opportunity. So maybe we could start with a big picture question. Um, I think it's fair to say that both the coronavirus and the economic dislocation that's you know, associated with it have affected men and women differently. Your work focuses on political crises and violence which surrounds them. So what similarities do you see between these types of crises and the public health and economic crisis that we're grappling with at the moment? Absolutely. So at the onset of the coronavirus, there was a lot of coverage in the media about how men were being disproportionately affected by the virus, particularly in terms of fatalities. Um, but as time has gone on, we've seen other data come out that shows that the coronavirus is disproportionately impacting women as well, but in different ways. So for instance, domestic violence rates have increased and women are predominantly victims of domestic violence. We've also seen more women drop out of the formal economy as a result of the economic pressure and social pressure that's been put on families. And so when we turn to political crises, we see kind of the same differential effects. So yes, men are disproportionately combatants in armed conflict, but that doesn't mean that women are only victims. Women also participate in conflict. And we therefore see conflict um, and political contestation more generally affect women in different ways. So there are hierarchies amongst women uh, that position them differently in terms of conflict. And I think we see this playing out with the coronavirus in terms of economic disparities and racial disparities, even among women as a population. Thank you. So I wanted to turn now to your book on uh, female combatants, the one that uh, we're very proud to publish at GU Press. Um, and I think one of the most striking findings in the book is that when we look at women combatants in different societies, we see both some universal truths and some, some profound differences. So if we get, begin with the differences, can you tell us a little bit about what you've found in looking at women combatants in the Ukraine, uh, greater Kurdistan, and in Colombia? How did the women's experience vary across those um, three societies? Absolutely. And so we look at a kind of range of different cultural contexts. No one's going to argue that kind of Colombia and Ukraine are, are the same socially or politically in this moment. But examining this difference really allows us to kind of understand women's range of motivations for participating in armed conflict, um, differences in, in age and culture and background that motivate women to participate, um, and also how kind of the conflict reshapes society more broadly. So if we take the case of Ukraine, uh, we had the initial kind of Maidan movement, which brought protesters onto the main square in Kiev. And women were a significant proportion of, of those protesters, 40 to roughly 50% uh, based on some ethnographic studies. Yet when that crisis transitioned from a political crisis into uh, a military crisis, women dropped out completely. Uh, we have very, very low numbers of women fighting in Ukraine, although women are, are fighting on both sides of the conflict, both for pro-Russian rebel groups um, and alongside the Ukrainian state. In other instances, we see uh, women become involved politically slowly over time. So in the case of Greater Kurdistan, women really became active in the Kurdish independence movement and autonomy movement in the 1980s after there was a crackdown on men participating in the movement in Turkey. Um, and so we see an evolution over time where more and more women have become in involved. And so this stands really in sharp contrast to what has happened in Ukraine. In Colombia, women have been involved um, from the very beginning in the FARC's insurgency, which is one of the longest running insurgencies in the world. Um, but the space that was available to them to participate both politically and militarily really opened up over time. And so we're able to understand differences in women's mobilization through these three cases. Thank you. So these three different uh, experiences that we've just discussed, um, they come from uh, countries with uh, very different political ideologies. 
So I wonder if you could talk about that, how that affects uh, the, the experiences of women. Absolutely. So in the case of Ukraine, the, the current conflict in Ukraine has seen kind of this separatist nationalist ideology uh, in the Donbass where individuals are identifying more uh, as, as Russian speakers, identifying more with Russian state. Um, but we've also seen the rise of right wing Ukrainian nationalist movements as well that have adopted neo Nazi or neo fascist ideology. And so that's been really interesting because women have participated in uh, right wing groups that we would traditionally consider to be very hostile towards women. Um, whereas in the Columbia case, we have kind of a leftist um, Marxist Leninist ideology that has really evolved over the course of time where the FARC is the major um, participant in that conflict has now adopted a really expansive um, emancipatory platform that includes LGBTQ rights. And so we see using these different cases how a group's ideology, um, whether it is closed or open to women, um, determines the number of women who participate in the conflict, but also the very presence of women can, can shift those ideologies over time. Uh, in the Kurdish case, we have a, a really kind of unique ideology um, being espoused by the leader of the PKK in Turkey. Um, and we have kind of equality, functional equality in terms of commands, um, but also a, a ideology of equality that permeates the groups. And so we see actually much higher levels of female participation in groups that have kind of gender uh, equality platforms. Thank you. Um, so in your book, you mentioned that Kurdish female soldiers, uh, what you describe them being mocked by their male colleagues, and then you go on to write, these complaints by women are not su substantially more severe than those recounted by female officers in the US military, and in some cases far less so. So I was wondering what the research tells us about the varied motivations and experiences of women in the US military. Absolutely. So my colleague, Ora Seckley, was uh, fortunate enough to be able to interview some uh, female combatants for us. And the stories that we came out of uh, came out of her interviews are, are really focused on women who were determined to lead, who were fighting for the same cause as their um, male co-combatants, um, but whose authority wasn't respected. When they issued a command on the battlefield, they never knew if their male soldiers were going to follow their command. And I think we see a lot of this uncertainty too in the US military, um, which is been plagued by kind of consistent uh, gender issues, shall we say, but also by um, much more profound issues such as high rates of sexual violence and discrimination against women, um, where, you know, uniforms and dress codes have very different standards for men and for women and where, for instance, for African American women, the width of the braids on their hair is regulated by uh, uniform codes. And so I think we see that that the US military is very um, controlling and managing of the space and opportunities available to women. And this has been really pointed to by uh, scholars as uh, a hyper concern with the presence of women, that this need to regulate and control reflects kind of the uncertainty around women's roles in the US military that persists even today, even though all combat opportunities have now been made available and open to women, we still see very strong resistance institutionally uh, that prevents women from taking up those positions. That's fascinating, thank you. Um, so we've been talking about the differences of, of, among women's experiences, but I wonder if we could talk about some of the common aspects of their experiences. Um, you've written that uh, there are higher levels of stigma for women ex-combatants and that women have more difficulty in re-entering society and that those uh, differences are at least in part because of the reorientation process, which has been designed with men in mind. So I'm wondering if you could please address uh, these two topics and some of the kind of universal experiences of women in the military. 
Absolutely. So I think one of the things that insurgent women really shows is that kind of despite um, survey results that show women are generally opposed to war or have more kind of docile foreign policy orientations or more doves than hawks, um, that when push comes to shove and women are confronted with violence, um, that women are just as willing to take up arms as men in protection of their homes and their families. So we see this narrative kind of across cases, but particularly in Ukraine and, and amongst the Kurdish regions where women feel like war has come to them, they have to protect their communities, their cultures, they're in a position of caring for others, caring for their children, caring for their elderly parents. And when men are not up to snuff, shall we say, that, that women will stand in their place. And in some cases, women will shame men into participating. Um, and that has been a very, very powerful tool that we've seen across a range of conflicts. Um, that being said, you know, as you noted, when conflict ends, women are often um, placed at a disadvantage because they are traditionally associated with this domestic caregiver role and fighting in an armed conflict has traditionally been gendered as male domain. So we have this societal tension about whether women should return to that kind of caregiver role or whether the skills and the training and the experiences that they've had um, participating in conflict should be part of their post-conflict life. And so we see in a lot of uh, disarmament and demobilization and reintegration programs that women are given things like sewing machines. So this has happened in Colombia, where a woman has said, you know, here's a sewing machine, we're going to teach you some sewing skills, go off and, and be a tailor, or they're given kind of entrepreneurial classes with the assumption that they'll, you know, cook meals in their home and, and sell them. And so a lot of these programs reinforce kind of gendered norms that place women in the home. Um, and that doesn't align well with women's own expectations for their lives post-conflict. And so, um, for instance, in Nepal, which also had a long-running civil war, um, women within the Nepalese Maoist um, military group, you know, they married across caste lines. They had very kind of expansive social roles within the organization. And when that conflict ended, a lot of those relationships broke up because they were not acceptable to uh, Nepalese society more generally. And women really found that their kind of social space that had opened up during conflict closed. And so I think more and more we need to pay attention to how conflict can be an opportunity for women to expand their role in society and how post-conflict programming can help defend that space. Right, thank you. Um, I mean, we touched on a few aspects of kind of universal experiences of women in combat, but are there others, um, if not universal, very common experiences of women across different cultures and societies? So we have a few ideas about kind of unique motivations to women. So I, I will start by saying most of the motivations of women for participating in armed combat or conflict are the same as men, right? They're driven by ideas of nationalism, loyalty, honor, sacrifice, uh, but some do seem unique to women. So both in the Middle East and in Colombia, we found that um, experiences of kind of domestic or family violence uh, would often drive women to leave their homes. And in that context, the most logical place to go was into an armed group that could provide them with physical security and safety. Um, we also see, as I mentioned earlier, that when there are manpower shortages, when not enough men can be convinced or mustered, uh, women are increasingly increasingly brought into combat. Um, the exception to that really are kind of Islamist Salafi jihadi groups whose ideology really confines women primarily to the domestic sphere. Um, but we also see commonalities in that, you know, female fighters tend to predominantly be younger um, in age without children, you know, without a lot of responsibilities. But in some of these long standing conflicts, as was the case in Nepal and Colombia and elsewhere, um, women remain with the group, even though it can sometimes mean giving up on family life, right? Not being able to get married, not being able to have children, um, and that these are policies enforced by the group. Um, so women remain very ideologically committed to the group 
uh, long after kind of their initial moment of joining. And we argue that this is kind of partly a process of socialization, but also partly because membership in these groups really does constrain other opportunities available to women. So if you were a member of the FARC, you fought in it, you're a farista, it really uh, limits kind of the social interactions that you're now able to have in post-conflict Colombia in important ways. Great, thank you. Um, so you alluded earlier to the fact that the very participation of women in the military and armed conflicts leads to further change. And in your book, you wrote, um, women's participation changes armed movements from within. Those policy changes are in turn, uh, um, excuse me, in turn have wider political and social consequences. So I wonder if you can describe some examples of this phenomenon. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to consider because we've seen particularly as some longstanding political conflicts have now transitioned out of the post-conflict phase that for instance, organizations like the FARC, which had you know in the range of 30% to 40% female participation, we continue to see women participating in the political parties um, that are associated with these armed groups. So it's in a really important avenue for women's political participation. And that often is one area where post-conflict agreements have really focused on including and transitioning women um, from the conflict to the post-conflict space. But I think it also has a very important demonstration effect to society more broadly that women can take on other roles. And so in some instances, we've seen um, high levels of female participation in armed groups in places like Sri Lanka, for instance, where the military has had to respond by creating uh, its own um, female units or allowing women to join the national military, which creates more opportunities for women more generally in society. Um, but I would, I would caveat this by saying that, you know, it's not a given. In many instances, um, women have been very, very involved in conflict in countries like Eritrea. Um, and in the post-conflict moment, that space really gets closed and kind of other cultural norms and patriarchal norms take over that limit um, women's engagement. We've seen this um, in the continual battle to kind of place women more at the center um, of Afghan society, for instance, um, and the kind of Taliban and other militant groups kind of continually pushing against women's expanded participation in that society. So, you know, as I mentioned, conflict can be an opportunity, um, but, but it can also really um, continue to limit women's opportunities for engagement. Right. Thank you. Um, you mentioned earlier that in Ukraine, um, women fighting on both sides of nationalist and separatist um, groups. Um, do we know um, anything about the results of, of their participation in the wider political process um, after their, their service in military or paramilitary organizations? It's a really contentious issue uh, in Ukraine currently. So for instance, the Ukrainian government had a mobilization drive that was focused specifically on women um, to try and expand their ranks. However, the women that they mobilized as part of this drive were um, labeled as kind of contractors rather than a career military. And so now that a lot of those women have done several years of service and demobilized, they're not eligible for the same veterans benefits as men who they fought alongside. Um, and so something that was seen as kind of like an expedient way to, to get more um, boots on the ground now is having really significant social repercussions. And the United States government and other governments are kind of working with the government of Ukraine to figure out how to accommodate the needs of, of this female veteran population that Ukraine has not previously had to, to deal with. Um, in terms of you know, women's participation uh, on the rebel group side or the nationalist militia side, it was really used as an important propaganda tool. Um, so you had, for instance, rebel leaders saying, uh, you know, look, we've we've had to call up all these women. These women are fighting. Where are the men? Essentially, you know, like you wussies, like where are you? Come fight with us. Um, and we see that saw that dynamic on both sides, both the government and and the rebel groups. But I would say that more generally, it it was kind of a point of 
pride for rebel groups that women were participating because they could point to the fact that this represented the mobilization of, of kind of all of society in support of their cause. But in terms of the kind of military or strategic impact of those women's participation, I would say it's, it was fairly limited. They were serving as medics, they were serving as kind of checkpoint guards, um, providing a lot of kind of support roles, cooking, et cetera. Um, but I don't think they had as much of a battlefield impact. Um, as one may have expected. Right, thank you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about groups that we might consider terrorist organizations and what the role of women are in some of those? Absolutely, and so uh, in the conclusion of Insurgent Women, we break down kind of some of the terrorist groups that fall broadly under the Islamist or Salafi Jihadi Banner. And so a lot of excellent work has been done on groups like Boko Haram by people like Hillary Matfis. Um, and Boko Haram is really interesting. It's a uh, Islamist militant group that operates in Northeast Nigeria. Its name essentially means, you know, Western education is forbidden. It's, it's positioned itself as anti-West, anti-state. Um, it primarily has women participating uh, and essentially role of forced forced marriages, kind of bush wives, where they clean the camp, they provide food for the fighters, they provide medical care, they uh, fetch supplies, et cetera. But what we really saw following um, kind of the mass kidnapping of girls that uh, in Chibok, which became uh, an international rallying cry of bring back our girls, that um, these 270 odd girls who were kidnapped were actually really used by the group um, to execute a number of suicide bombings. So after this mad ki mass kidnapping, uh, the group's suicide bombings kind of went, went off the charts and, and it was primarily these young women uh, that had been forced into the group. They had another wave of kidnappings um, and a lot of those women are still unaccounted for. So that's, that's kind of been the anomaly um, in terms of kind of Islamist terrorist groups. Other groups really constrain the roles of women to kind of serving in the household, serving as wives. With ISIS, we saw a few women rise to prominence as propagandists, particularly on social media. These were primarily women from the West who had joined the group, traveled from you know, Australia, the UK, uh, and the United States, and were kind of fluent in social media um, and English. But those women, you know, again, were really symbolic. Uh, they showed kind of the whole of society, the mobilization of families, the mobilization of young people, uh, and were a really important conduit for getting the group's message out. But again, their kind of military impact, their battlefield impact was, was non-existent uh, outside of this kind of propagandist and fundraising role. Thank you. Um, so if we go back to the US military for a moment, um, you talked about some of the challenges um, women face uh, both while serving and afterwards. I was wondering if you could talk about potential reforms or things that could be done um, to make service and, and after service life more equal. You know, it's, it's really interesting. I was driving through Virginia a little while ago and there were ads for, uh, you know, the VA medical hospitals and they featured African American women. And it was the first time, I think, in my recent experience where the ideal of a veteran was depicted as an African American woman. Um, and yet I think that this is increasingly um, something that we need to acknowledge within the US military that our idea of who is a soldier and who is a typical soldier is, is shifting in really profound ways and quite rapidly and uh, the institutions need to catch up. And so I think there's a lot of important work being done on kind of leaky pipelines, why women aren't advanced and aren't promoted um, through many institutions, not just the US military, also academia. Um, and part of that has to do with this assumption that women are going to be caregivers, they're going to have children, they're gonna care for those children. Um, and that they have kind of social limitations placed on them that if we think about it, men also do, right? Men are also fathers. Men are also placed in caregiving roles. Um, and yet the expectation of that burden continues to fall on women. And so I think until we really grapple with that as a society, we're going to continue to see uh, limitations to women's advancement more generally. Um, in terms of kind of issues of, of discrimination within armed groups generally, um, 
even in groups that place women on co-equal footing in terms of leadership or espouse kind of feminist ideologies, we still see a lot of restrictions placed on women. So for instance, the FARC, which has this kind of feminist platform, um, still for a very long time had uh, forced contraception and forced abortions within the group because it was seen that uh, if women had children and they had ties outside that they would be less loyal to the organization. So early on women were forced to give up children um, and uh, increasingly they were forced to, to receive abortions. At the same time, the group condoned sexual relations amongst members, that, that was acceptable. Homosexual relations were not initially. Um, and so groups of all kinds regulate uh, women's lives and, and participation in kind of militarized or armed groups is no different from the rest of society. Great, thank you. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about your most recent work. And so if we turn to women who are accused of war crimes, um, can you talk a little bit about how the legal system is gendered? Absolutely. So in women as war criminals, uh, my co-author Isabella Stefani and I look at three different types of legal systems, really. The international criminal tribunal system set up by the UN um, and as applied in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, the military justice system uh, as applied in the United States and kind of terrorism prosecutions as pursued in the United States. And what we see across these three different legal platforms is that even though on the surface, we have equality before the law, that we have um, gendered interpretations and gendered applications of that law. So to stick with the US focus, um, you know, female terrorists are prosecuted at lower rates than male terrorists. They're more likely to plea out or receive reduced sentences. Um, and they're more likely to be charged with um, you know, terrorism financing or something like that, rather than kind of violent uh, oriented charges. And this is really a problem because those women contribute to terrorist groups in very, very important ways. And so one case that we take up is that of Samantha al Hassani, who is uh, an American woman from Elkhart, Indiana, who alongside her husband traveled to Syria to join ISIS. Um, and she has since being apprehended claimed that, you know, she was just doing what her husband told her to do. She never really believed in ISIS. She's a Jehovah's Witness. Um, and yet there's clear evidence that she um, transferred funds in support of the group. She traveled to Syria. Um, she supported her husband and brother-in-law while there. Um, but also importantly, she enslaved three Iraqi Yazidi children um, oh. while she was in Syria. And the frustration for me, and I think part of this kind of gendered application of law is that instead of taking this woman seriously as someone who enslaved other human beings, she's being prosecuted and ultimately pled out to terrorism financing charges with a maximum sentence of 10 years in prison. Um, and her defense is continuing to use this narrative of, oh, my husband made me do it. And I think the frustration is that, you know, a man made me do it continues to be a viable defense. And that is a reflection of the fact that we're not taking these women's agency seriously, and we don't have the legal mechanisms available to do so. Thank you. So uh, I think we have time for one final question. Um, given what you just um, narrated, uh, which is fascinating and, and horrifying all at the same time, um, what kind of reforms could help to end the, the gender bias in, in the legal system? I think that we, you know, need to have a balance here that in some instances, you know, yes, women are following the commands of their superiors, but just as men are following the commands of the superiors. And I think that this issue really comes to a head um, when thinking about ISIS. So many, many young men were forcibly recruited into ISIS or brought by their parents. Um, you know, children as young as nine have been prosecuted in countries like Iraq. And yet there is this assumption here that all the women who participated, you know, were just coerced or brainwashed or, you know, are not responsible for their participation. Um, and I think that we need to stop using these gendered narratives in the media and we need to take women's participation seriously. But we also need to recognize that men's participation in armed conflict too is also complex. Right? Not every man or boy participates voluntarily. They have complex motivations 
as do women. And I think until you know we recognize this, um, it's, it's gonna be difficult to get legal reform. I don't think the problem is with the law. I think many of the laws are good and just, it's with how they're applied and how they're interpreted in ways that undermine women's agency. Um, and so we really get into this uh, in the case of Pauline Yeramashuhuko, who was prosecuted by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. She was charged with genocide and rape as a weapon of war. And we really argue that the failure to acknowledge her as a woman at all um, led to some pretty unjust outcomes in that case. Whereas in other instances, you know, we, we focus too much on an individual's gender. So we need more balance. That's my main prescription, that we need more balance in the application of law. Thank you. Well, I wish we could continue this uh, conversation, but I think unfortunately we're gonna have to leave it there. But I want to thank you so much for being with us today. This was really a, a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and, and I hope we'll have more opportunities to engage. Same here. And I wanted to let everyone know that um, two weeks from today, we'll be talking to Kansas State University Professor Melinda Crow about digital humanities in the age of COVID. So I hope you'll be able to join us then. And thank you again, Jessica. Thank you. Take care everyone, bye-bye. <laughs>